Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to AFMI's webinar on governance and transition to sustainable finance. My name is Tonya Plachetniuk, and I'm Associate Director of Policy here at AFMI, and I have the pleasure of introducing today's event. Recently, AFMI and Latham and Watkins wrote a paper together that aims to provide an industry roadmap to help embed sustainable finance into banks' strategy and governance. And today, we just wanted to dig a bit more into this important subject. So today, to, during today's webinar, we will be covering topics such as how corporate governance can support the growth of sustainable finance, what are the main building blocks of sustainable corporate governance for banks, and what are the challenges that banks might be facing on their way to creating a governance structure that can support achieving their business objectives related to sustainable financing. We will start the session with a brief keynote address by Mats Isaksson, who is the Head of Corporate Governance and Corporate Finance Division at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, known as OECD. Matt's main responsibilities include corporate governance, capital markets, corporate finance, and state-owned enterprises in his role. Following the first keynote address, we will have another keynote, which will be given by Sipra Kietekainen, who is a member of the European Parliament and who has been a very strong advocate of a transition to sustainable finance through, amongst other activities, her work as the lead negotiator on the first sustainable finance legislative proposals, such as EU disclosure and taxonomy regulations. Both Mats and Sirpa will then join Simon Connell, who is the head of sustainability strategy at Standard Chartered Bank, and who also acts as a co-chair of AFME Sustainable Finance Steering Committee, which we are very proud of, by the way. The discussion will be moderated by Nicola Higgs, partner at Latham at Watkins, who has been helping banks and other financial institutions navigate this very complex sustainable finance regulatory landscape, and who also led Latham and Watkins' team effort on our recent publication. The webinar will be concluded with a Q&A, so please send your questions to the speakers using the Q&A button on the right-hand side of the screen. Last but not the least, I would like to say a personal and huge thank you to everyone who has given their time and effort and expertise to create today's program, and of course, to the speakers who we look forward to hearing from today. I'm now very pleased to welcome our first speaker, Mats Isaksson, to give the first keynote address. Mats, over to you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and for the invitation to participate and good morning everybody. Uh, if you're wondering about my company here behind me, uh, I'm actually sitting in my daughter's uh, studio here in Paris, uh, but I hope it won't distract you too much and that you can focus somewhat on what I will be saying as well. What I, what I would like to do at the very outset as an economist is to talk a little bit about how we should understand these fairly vague concepts of sustainability and also another term that has come into play, which is uh, resilience. I think it is important uh, to know uh, for policymakers uh, and that the best guarantee for both sustainability and resilience is about adaptation, innovation and business dynamics. Uh, it is not about uh, petrifying the current structures or uh, provide incentives for lock in in, uh, in existing uh, activities. And to achieve this, what we need is to be able to identify and price both risks and opportunities that financial markets can help uh, influence. And the way they do it, obviously, is that they price, they identify, and they allocate uh, capital to activities that will help us uh, monitor and mitigate uh, risks with, res with respect to, uh, but also opportunities, I should say, with respect to uh, sustainability and, uh, and resilience. 
this is a bit of the backcloth and the philosophy that uh, sort of entered uh, a recent publication that we uh, published at the OECD, which is called the OECD Business and Finance Outlook, uh, which is focused on sustainable and uh, resilient uh, finance. And what we do in this report is that we sort of address both sides of the of the coin, if you want, uh, both the perspective of the investors who have an ambition to allocate their uh, investments in accordance with some set uh, priorities uh, for sustainability and resilience. It could be environmental purposes and it could be passive uh, avoidance of certain of certain activities, etc. But also on the other side of the coin, uh, the uh, the activities going on in corporations in order to identify and mitigate and assess and also disclose uh, risks related to sustainability and and resilience, and of course, in a, in a number of areas and for practical purposes. Uh, environment is one of the factors that needs to be taken into, a, into account. But I would like again to, um, to, to emphasize that this system of identifying pricing and allocating resources must be a dynamic process where we believe that markets can play uh, a very important role and a very constructive role uh, if only they are given the right uh, tools to, to, to do so. And one of the, um, uh, I should say, two of the most important tools that uh, we know belongs to data, information, and uh, disclosure. So I will talk a little bit about that for the next uh, four minutes. On the investor side, uh, what we do uh, and what we find is that the, I mean, and, and this is still in, at an early stage, so we shouldn't be uh, too judgmental about it, but we really find that many of the uh, tools that are at the disposal of investors when it comes to indices and ratings, etc., when it comes to ESG uh, performance, um, they vary quite a lot in terms of internal consistency and they also vary a lot among themselves. So you can go, you can have a totally different sort of, uh, outcome in terms of your investment choices by using one index called ESG index uh, from using another uh, provider's ESG index and the outcomes may be quite, quite uh, different. They may even be, be, uh, be contradictory. Uh, we find also, and you will see this uh, in, in the, the data we have in the, in the report, chapters one and two, uh, that there are also uh, some even adverse effects when it comes to the environment issue, uh, where some ratings uh, actually uh, run contrary to the, to, the, uh, to the objectives that are set maybe by the investors. And, and what this leaves us with, and I'm saying we're still at an early Case, and I think there will be improvements down the line. But what it leaves us with is a situation where, where uh, uh, the intentions of uh, investors uh, may not be, they may not be able to live up to their intentions by using some of these uh, indices or, or ratings, which is, which is sad because this is what they want to do and this is what they promise their, their beneficiaries, etc. So, we believe that there, there, is, there is a great scope to, to improve um, uh, the quality and consistencies of these, of these tools that otherwise can be, very, can be very useful. The other side, again, going into the company, uh, the important thing, uh, uh, proper mechanisms, and this is at the core of corporate governance. I mean, the, 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 the disclosure and, and risk management are two to uh, two of the main pillars of, of corporate governance, if you want. Uh, so I think there we are also at a fairly early stage when it comes to companies understanding what structures they need to put in place in order 
to um, uh, address some of the new issues in in uh, in, uh, in risk management, such as environmental uh, risks, uh, for example. Uh, there are lots of initiatives going on, and uh, they are they are all uh, worth uh, worth looking at. Uh, and I believe that this will be the challenge for the coming years for companies to uh, find their feet, if you want, with respect to how to structure themselves, what kind of competences they need, uh, how the board wants to structure itself around these issues, do they want to have special committees, et cetera, et cetera. And the, um, the, um, the, um, the challenge here, of course, is to uh, and and this this sort of risk management. I mean, it's it's as old as the the corporate form. It's several hundred years old. I mean, this is one of the core uh, activities of any corporation is is risk management and risk mitigation, uh, because this is also something that markets are are looking for. Uh, so one of the key challenges here going going down the line is to uh, develop. Uh, metrics and even disclosure uh, uh, items that that are consistent, that are comparable, and that are verifiable. If we can make progress in that area, we will uh, also advance on what I initially mentioned as the ability for investors to identify to price and to allocate capital uh, efficiently uh, and in a dynamic fashion uh, that will help us uh, maintain sustainability and reach uh, resilience in the in our economies. So, thank you very much for my ten minutes. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, thank you. Thanks for your insightful remarks. I think you went down to the to, to, to the heart of the problem uh, that we would need to improve the tools absolutely to ensure that uh, the markets can can obtain the necessary information to price the risks and opportunities appropriately and allocate capital towards sustainable causes. Thank you. Now it's my pleasure to introduce the second keynote, Dipra Pietekainen. Uh, over to you, Sirpa. Much and uh, thank you for organizing this very uh, topical and important discussion. Well, I'll uh, sort of lay out some of the challenges that uh, the EU has been trying to solve already and what are ahead of us. And uh, to start with, and actually it's very nice to uh, uh, refer to the previous speaker, we need harmonized indicators and life cycle analysis. We need harmonized information. And this is very important because think of the accounting uh, uh, and uh, the systems, if you would have 250 different accounting systems used all over, and then it would be up to investors and banks to, to figure out how you compare the different systems. And quite often they would be opaque that you do not even know how they function. And then you would need to uh, 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 sort of think that what are good investments or profitable companies. So this sort of uh, the the idea of data, and that uh, that goes to the taxonomy that uh, tries to define what uh, uh, <clears throat> what then you should measure in the environmental field uh, and the social uh, a bit later on is a crux, but then sort of the next steps there. And that goes to non-financial reporting directive also. But the point is that we need uh, one layer behind that. And there's a lot of work globally going on about uh, the indicators. OECD is doing the work there. The UNPRI is doing the work. There's a lot of private initiatives, uh, the Stability for Forum and so on. It's just sort of a putting the work together. And hopefully this is the basis what we have then on the NFRRD. Then uh, uh, in the longer run, I think that especially, especially for small banks and investors, you would need this kind of a nutritional information uh, uh, data. And this is the sustainability data uh, uh, index or a platform uh, 
uh, where you could see like you, in nutrition, you know how much calories you have or cal or uh, iron or whatever uh, proteins you have in cauliflower and that the matter in, the, uh, in, in your sandwich, you could look at the figures directly. And it's a bit the same thing that you would need to be able for SMEs and for small actors to, to report on the basis, okay, I have this kind of a car, so approximately it's CO2 impact, biodiversity impact and so on is this and that. Okay, uh, I'm just uh, using quite substantial time about this data and harmonized, uh, uh, harmonized initiatives, because if you get this wrong, then the actual uh, other efforts are going to be going wrong too. Then the second point that that is on the taxonomy is that you shouldn't concentrate in on only one figure, uh, figure or thing like the climate change. And this is what I'm a bit afraid in, in some of the activity, activities, because if you do not look the whole a uh, uh, whole sector of environmental and social impacts, you are going to end up with this kind of a palm oil uh, tra uh, tragedy, uh, strategies and uh, um, uh, sunk investments where you think something might be good for the climate, but you do not take into account, uh, for example, biodiversity in this case, or you can't uh, uh, claim that uh, solar panels are green and sustainable investment if you produce them with the child labor and with, uh, with poor uh, environmental controls on, uh, controls on production with a lot of uh, toxic emissions. So, and this all sort of what needs to happen, lot needs to happen, was already based in 2018 uh, on the AgeLex work uh, about what needs to happen in the financial sector for it to be sustainable. And before this has been uh, discussed, and I have had privilege to talk with you with after about these things earlier on, at least at 10 years, what needs to happen on, on this sector? One is this uh, uh, understanding what to report and how to report and how to measure what is sustainable, and this is the taxonomy, and it includes uh, not only climate, but biodiversity, emissions, resource use, uh, waste, uh, toxicity, uh, and then I don't know if I mentioned biodiversity and the in indirect land use. We are going to have the criteria for climate use in uh, uh, operable 22 and the rest uh, beginning uh, 23, and before that the Commission is coming up uh, with its evaluation when and how to develop the social criteria. And as important as it is to sort of describe and see what is uh, positive in, uh, in, in actions is to see what is significant harm. And in this regulation, we do have this do no significant harm principle that laid sort of uh, the, the uh, backstop on activities like uh, fossil fuels, uh, solid fossil fuels, or the child labor, as, as I mentioned, or uh, or toxicity impacting the environment or others. And then when it comes to the next thing, and this goes to disclosure regulation, where it is uh, compulsory for financial investors to tell, expose the uh, environmental impact uh, of, of the investments, uh, it is that there needs to be quite a lot of flexibility because just like in accounting, you can't say that this is the only thing and this is good and uh, this is bad. It's, it's not the dichotomy. It is a set of indicators and you need to balance together the biodiversity, water consumption, CO2 emissions, resource consumption, the longevity of the products and many, many things. And then probably in, in construction, cars, textiles, whatever, you, you have a, a different kinds of sets that can be sustainable or that matter that could be unsustainable, even though they would be sustainable in, in some parts uh, some parts of their activity. So disclosure is important, taxonomy is important, but for the banks that are going to be, I think, in the next round uh, to use this information, it is important that you get that information out of the companies, the, the, uh, the industries, and this is where the non-financial reporting directive uh, comes in. Personally, I would prefer to use the accounting directive because then it would set the right the balance who, who would need to report, what to report, and about the auditing also because what you, you say would need to be uh, true. 
Uh, then we are going to have uh, uh, coming up from Commission the uh, issues from the uh, corporate governance uh, and what is sustainable corporate governance. Is it one or two directives in which form? I would uh, uh, in integrate it in the corporate law or shareholders' rights directive. Probably it's going to be a separate regulation. And the question is, when do? How do you then uh, sort of uh, make the coherence and alignment with the accounting directive, with taxonomy, with disclosure, uh, non-financial reporting directive, and then if you have a separate sustainability uh, re uh, regulation or directive, and. Uh, uh, there, there. Just my opinion is uh, that we would need to herd uh, the crowds to to try to make it as simple and coherent and easily understandable as as uh, uh, possible. Then, if we look uh, for the future, and this is the uh, Commission's roadmap on sustainable finance coming up on uh, next year. There's the pointings. How do we get it on the credit ratings? Uh, and then I mean on, on private, but also on the uh, public side. How in the longer run we integrate this information that I was talking about to IFRS or some other international uh, reporting and uh, uh, accounting standard? How do we put it on the next uh, next parcel framework that sets uh, the uh, requirements for banking? But before putting these requirements, there needs to be this uh, first level, what I referred about the indicators and others, that the banks do get the information how to uh, assess their uh, 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 customers on this field. And then, and uh, I think that I'm almost uh, consumed my time, uh, what I would like to lay for the discussion is the concept of triple materiality, because I'm uh, sort of uh, anticipating this is going to be very important on the risk assessment. Uh, for the banks uh, also. And the first level is, of course, the economic risk and technology risk, uh, very familiar to everybody. The second level is the direct impact of uh, biodiversity crisis or climate crisis on that business's uh, activities. Are my, uh, uh, my, my uh, headquarters going to be flooded uh, in storms, or am I going to have some problems in the uh, uh, production chains and, uh, uh, and, and on the sourcing of raw materials, forest products, for example, forest fires. But the triple level is that in the existential level, does my investment, does my lending increase climate change and biodiversity less loss? And because this is not only something that is threatening us after 100 years or 200 years, it's threatening us within 10 years. It is as viable risk. And then if you are contributing to climate risk increase, it means you are quite literally destroying your own economic stability and working environments. Because uh, uh, according to estimates, the impact of the climate change if we do not uh, take effective measures, could be after 10, 15 years, years tenfold the cost what the corona cost has been. And we all know what that would do to any bank or any any economic system. So that that's why the triple materiality sort of, if you in overall uh, uh, proceed enhance the uh, that kind of a negative trend, you are creating a economic viable risk to yourself. This is a very important concept that uh, needs to be a bit more specified, but uh, that is around in the uh, discussions. And to get this information, and this is my last point, what we would need to require from the companies is transition plans. So you couldn't say to Shell or Exxon or to any one big company that, okay, you are in bad business and we are not lending to you. If they have a viable transition plan, how to de-invest from uh, a negative side to be sustainable and how to do it within a uh, viable of future, let's say, 10 or 20 years, then it decreases the risk or it puts it even if it is green investment on, on positive green investment side. But if the company is not doing anything, then it is a economic substantial risk that should be reflected on the price of the loans and uh, uh, reserved capitals and, and, and all that sector. 
and this transition. So that is the point. Do not only report. It is like you can't report in the economic side only. We are making a deficit year after year, but how, this is the way how it is in our business. But you need to do something to it. Do not only say that you are environmentally or socially uh, in problematic areas, but do something about it and show how you can do it. Thank you. A lot of food for thought there. Um, so we're now going to take it to the panel discussion. Um, as uh, Tonya mentioned at the start, if you have any Q&A, please do use the Q&A function. I'll be keeping an eye on those um, and putting them to the panelists as they as they come through. Um, but Simon, just just coming to you first for for an industry perspective and reaction to some of the statements made from Matt and from Serpa. I think a lot of topics were mentioned there. We talked about um, strategy. We talked about the sort of the risks and the rewards from adapting to a more sustainable business model. Um, we talked about prudential risk management. Um, they all sort of sit under the broader umbrella of of corporate governance. And so, from your perspective. How do you build that effective corporate governance umbrella around those transition risks that were just mentioned? Thank you, Nicola, and thank you to everyone who's joining us today. Um, oh, there was a lot covered. I think let's start with the definition that governance is how decisions are made, and that implicitly includes what decisions are made. And so I think to my mind, we, we probably start to come into scoping, timing, and sequencing. So if we think about scoping, what I find really interesting about this conversation is you know, ESG is probably the second most popular word of 2020. We all know what the first most popular word is, um, but it's that G, that governance, the, the, the G in ESG. And that's, I think, where we come to scoping, because most commonly in a financial services context, when we're thinking about G, it's the governance where financial institutions are assessing the decision making of their clients and counterparties. And actually what I find really interesting in particular Serpa's comments here about sustainable corporate governance is this, and what we're talking about here is how decisions are made within financial institutions. So we're turning that telescope around. So that's the scoping piece. We're looking at ourselves now rather than looking at our clients and counterparties. I think that then takes us on to the issue of timing. Um, and the main thing I'd acknowledge, and, and this is where I don't want people to get intimidated by this really helpful Afme Latham and Watkins paper is Standard Chartered is not yet making all the decisions that we need to. Uh, I'm sure others are in a similar situation. And I think that's where the paper is such a helpful contribution if we consider it as a roadmap. Because it says here are all the things you need to be thinking about. We're not necessarily there today. And that naturally takes us on to my third piece, which is sequencing. Yeah. It's a little bit like Christmas Day. We're, we're there, we're looking at the Christmas tree, there's a pile of presents underneath it. Which one are we going to open first? <laughs> is it the big one? Is it the small one that might have something expensive in it? Is it that funny shaped one? Um, and I think that's where we get back to our decision, uh, to our definition of governance, which is how are decisions made? And I think in that context, you have to start with oversight, as it's defined in, in the AFME paper. What's the structure? Who's your apex decision-making body for making that decision around sequencing? We've got our scope. We know we're looking within financial institutions. But what, how do we get to timing? How do we decide which bits to tackle first is, is, I think, to my mind, getting that apex structure. And I might return a little bit later in the panel to some of our work on that, but I think maybe I'll pass the mic for now. Thanks, Simon. Um, and I, I like that analogy of the different size Christmas presents, and that's probably a good time to turn to Matt's, um, because that, this is really an area where the OECD has contributed very significantly to the agenda, looking at corporate governance and defining what that means and defining what the different tenets or pillars of corporate governance are that might help with that sequencing that, that um, Simon just mentioned. Um, so Matt, what, what's your perspective on that? You know, how do firms go about thinking about the different pillars of their sequencing? Well, I would, I would, maybe I should first say that, I mean, what we have done, because we're the standard setter on corporate governance for G20 and the Financial Stability Board and the OED, uh, our approach is obviously not to second guess or to lecture individual companies on, on how they should structure their corporate governance mechanics, if you want. Uh, what we basically do is to make sure that the regulatory and legislative framework 
uh, around corporations or their corporate governance uh, has sort of the right incentives in place to do the right thing and come uh, to to um, to the dis decisions that 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 benefits the company and importantly i would say uh, that the structure facilitates for corporate governance to access finance and in particularly to access equity financing i'm i'm sorry to say this in a bank environment but, but uh, also also bankers are interested that there is that there is a strong balance sheet uh, and the what, what I would what I would say in the sequencing of things is that I believe that the, the first thing that usually corporations look at is the regulatory uh, and legislative environment in which they operate. What are the environmental laws? What are the boundaries in terms of our operations, in terms of relationships with stakeholders, et cetera, et cetera? And then they operate within that. And uh, with all due respect to the finance industry and 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 and, and related players, I, I think that there are there are limits to how much corporations can internalize externalities uh, without a firm regulatory framework in the areas like, for example, on environment or biodiversity or. Uh, labor law or whatever. Uh, I think there is a. Uh, I think we should have reasonable expectations uh, uh, in in terms of having market fix what is basically a market failure. And a market failure is not a negative word for an economist. This is just another word for externalities that people normally shouldn't or don't care about. So I think that this this is where we need to start the discussion and then also to have a little bit of a division of responsibilities. What are businesses good at and what are uh, what are policymakers good at? And I think businesses are really good uh, in terms of innovation, uh, in terms of bringing new products, new processes and everything to the market. And here the financing is extremely important that the allocation gets it right. Uh, there is even a study from the ECB uh, uh, recently that shows that Markets with, or countries, I should say, with deeper uh, and, and more efficient equity markets actually have a lower carbon footprint than, uh, than, than other markets. Uh, so if you have active, well-functioning, deep uh, stock markets, that will actually, according to this uh, report at least, uh, help the process of greening uh, our, our, our planet. Uh, so I, I can go into the details why this is the case, which they also go into, but uh, I think this is the fulcrum where we need to divide responsibilities and, um, how should I say, manage our expectations of various parties. Thank you, Matt. Um, and Simon, you, you, you promised when you last spoke a little bit more of a sort of practical insight um, into your own experience of, of designing a corporate governance framework and also just noting your, your point around it really being a, a journey and, and it's, a, it's a stage of transition for most institutions. Um, but it would be good to hear from you some of the sort of key topics or work streams you've been looking at to sort of start, start structuring your corporate governance around sustainable finance. Thank you, Nicola. So I would echo your point, we're, we're not at target operating model yet. I would distill much of this down to Mads' comments and, and Serpa's as well, that I think it's about recognizing that things that have traditionally been non-financial or in some cases reputational for financial institutions are rapidly becoming financial and thus pricing and credit centric. Um, and so for anybody who's not yet read the AFME paper, you know, maybe you, you arrived here for us to sell you that as your weekend reading. Um, it provides a really helpful set of 15 principles. And I just really want to dive in two of those just to give a few examples of how we're working. So principle two proposes this one firm approach. And so in 2018, Standard Chartered created a sustainability forum. So we went to our CEO's top team. We said, give us one nomination each. It doesn't have to be someone who knows anything about sustainability. It just needs to be someone who's really effective at getting things done for your function. And so that includes senior leaders from risk, from finance, business, risk, and that body oversees the development of our sustainability strategy and the delivery against it, including our sustainability aspirations, which is a public 
scorecard, if you will, um, of our contribution towards the, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. It reports upwards to our executive committee, so our management team, as we call it, and to our board level brand values and conduct committee, who ask us plenty of challenging questions all the time. Um, and then informing its work are our climate risk management forum, our human rights working group, and our sustainable finance working group. So I think that's really trying to draw on that piece that says, let's have that coordination. Um, so, and again, because we're trying for a life cycle approach here, the forum oversees our stakeholder engagement and it oversees our disclosures approach as well. So we've got this integrated model that says, okay, what is expected of us? That includes regulation and legislation as, as, as others have spoken to. How are we responding and how are we trying our best? It doesn't always succeed, but to have a one firm approach to that. And then how are we showing those stakeholders the progress that we've made? And then I think if I dive into principle six, which is around enterprise risk management framework, um, one of the areas that we think we've succeeded in, in recent years is by making climate risk what we call a material cross-cutting risk in our enterprise risk management framework. So what that means is it sits above all these principal risk types, credit, compliance, and so on, and it informs all of them. And so it connects into each of those, and it requires the risk framework owners for each of those to say, okay, how does climate impact my management of my risk within my risk type? And that's great because it doesn't sit in a silo. It's not sort of someone's problem to manage. It's everyone's problem to manage within that framework. Our chief risk officer is, is, the, uh, is the SMR responsible for that. And our climate risk appetite statement actually makes specific reference to alignment with the Paris Agreement. So we're all clear here what we're all aiming for. Um, and so again, that's working. But to my point about not being a target operating model, one of the biggest challenges that we've been grappling with this year and doubtless will carry into next is how do we extend that approach from climate risk to wider sustainability? What is the definition we're using? And that's the biggest challenge for us. What is in, what is out as we're thinking about that? And then how do we bring that in? How do we give a framework for all those risk framework owners to act? But because we've seen the success bringing this into the enterprise risk framework for climate risk, we know it needs to be done. We're just working on how. I think Zeppel was waving there. So Zeppa, did you want to come in? Well, I don't want to, uh, Simon, I don't want to uh, interrupt you, so please go on. Uh, no, no, I'm, 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 I'm pretty much done there, so, so either back to you or to Nicola. Well, Zeppa, I think I it see. is the right time to come to you, so, so you go away. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm jumping here. Probably you can see up and down to, uh, to, to pose a question for you, Simon and Mats. Uh, how to proceed, because I think that your points uh, interlink. And this is this sort of a skill and carabis. Uh, uh, do, do you have the regulation first, and then uh, <clears throat> it is the, uh, the, the private sector that comply, or the private sector does its efforts first? And uh, <clears throat> uh, it has to be a, a, a bit cynical, um, and knowing how pol politics goes nowadays, and with all the populism and, and what we see. I wouldn't hold my breath that the politics will solve the climate crisis. And that's why I think it is actually financial sector and accountants that I rely much more than to politics and Greenpeace to do it. And while I, uh, I acknowledge that you can't sort of uh, uh, ask the businesses to, to go uh, exceed certain limits and to be angels because then they just bankrupt in the global economy. Uh, we would need to find this kind of uh, way how to cooperate. Sort of this, this is the two horses carriage, where both are pulling the private sector with its own initiatives and forefront, but also lobbying for good regulation in politics. Because I uh, said you can't do it all, uh, all of your, uh, all of your loan, and uh, this goes to this, for example. Uh, if I can sort of erase the uh, hot topic on the table, uh, the uh, the age leg didn't start that well for various reasons because the banks were not included, and I think that the lending and the banks should have been included and after to start with because uh, there that you regulate in different stages the investments and lending is always carrying the risk that you have different parameters and regulations and it gets more complicated and less effective. Uh, so this is the big problem uh, to start with. And uh, <clears throat> so the, my question is that, uh, do you feel that you could be supportive for that kind of an idea to take these points and taxonomies uh, into account and to develop the uh, 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 data registers 
in the next uh, phases of the Basel and uh, CRDs and, and all this, uh, knowing that you have in, in common yourself uh, a bit of uh, diverse opinions and there are challenges for some of the banks. And uh, so how to do this sequencing in this uh, way too. And then very important point, and I just wanted to comment that, Simon, about how to develop the uh, the other indicators, not only the climate. And if I just would like underline one big risk there, and believe me, I'm a Finn, I know what I'm talking about, is this uh, overhype of, of bioeconomy. Because if you put all the demand on, on forests and uh, on, on uh, vegetation and bio-based economy, on energy, on housing, on textiles, on packing, uh, on chemicals and whatever, it's not going to be sustainable. And someone would need to uh, uh, have the analytical framework on place before the investments are there, because then it, it's, a, as we know, it is a sidetrack. It's it's a, a sunk investment and it's a awful pain to start sort of a de-investing and reinvesting and so just sort of a seeing a, a a huge sort of a <clears throat> elephant in the room on 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 this bioeconomy height. Thank you for allowing me the the question and comment. Thanks very much, um, Serpa. Um, and, and Matt, well, what's your sort of reaction to to the discussion that's just been had? Um, I, I think that. You know, this all sort of leads to, um, you know, thinking about the future direction of travel um, and thinking about corporate governance as, a, as an international topic rather than a sort of localized topic for many of the, the global financial institutions that are, that are listening in today. Um, how do how do policymakers and, and banks themselves need to think about this as a as a global consolidated topic? And, and to what extent do you see it feasible to have sort of international regulatory convergence around some of these policies on on governance? Well, let me first uh, echo, and I agree with uh, with the with the fact that this is a two horse carriage. I think you you call it, uh, and I think. This is certainly true, and there needs to be efforts on on uh, on both sides. Um, I think what and and I'm saddened to hear that that you the, you, you think the prospects for for government uh, intervention and 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 hard re re regulation is is meager. Uh, that's discouraging indeed, but maybe we will advance also in that in that area. Uh, because if we if we if we live in sort of I think if we live in a uh, if we live in a world where we believe that everything being done to uh, improve our social and, and, and physical environment is a win-win solution, uh, I think we're living in a, a bit of a dream world. I mean, the carbon transition will cost, it will cost money uh, and it will cost investment. And as long as we don't have prices, something else than business as usual happen. And I, that's where I believe uh, pricing, uh, pricing of environment uh, comes into into play, and and also regulation. I mean, if you if you if you prohibit something, uh, it is a way of pricing things because the price becomes indefinitely high. So that's also a pricing issue. You say we can't have uh, we can't have uh, uh, cars that run on on diesel. For example, I mean, then the price of diesel cars is indefinitely high, and markets will adjust uh, to that. Uh, I think going back to what I said before and your question about global uh, perspectives, I believe that Europe has a uh, an, an ambitious uh, agenda in the area of of, of ESG and, and and climate, which obviously is 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 extremely welcome. Uh, but we also have a equivalent challenge when it comes to the dynamics of our uh, our capital markets. I mean, we now have in the last I don't know maybe 15 years the importance of capital markets in Europe has shrunk by half, and it's you know maybe somewhere around 10% in terms of equity markets today. I mean, the 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 market cap of DAX DAX 30 is about two thirds of the market cap of Apple alone. It says something about uh, where we stand. So I think we need to 
And if we believe that investment is part of the solution, more investment, more green investment, more risk taking in, in future technologies, etc., we need to thread this balance where we keep the incentives for corporations and investors alive uh, to invest in, to, to use equity to invest in, 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 in the future. And this requires, I believe, uh, that we also look at the conditions for, uh, for listing companies, for being listed, and the balance between uh, uh, compliance requirement, disclosure requirements, etc. I think we always need to make sure that there is a uh, that we that we don't go beyond a point where we scare companies away from the public eye, from being listed, because once they fly away from that, they may they go dark, so to speak, or they go abroad. I mean, they go they they. The, 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 the capital markets and, and, and business today is global. And if you look at developments in, in uh, so I think often when we look at what you said as, as, and I think it's a good question, when we look at the, you know, the corporate governance uh, uh, policies and regulations in Europe, I think what we should look at to some extent is not only sort of a, a, a com least common denominator within the European countries, but I think it's increasingly important to look at what are other markets doing? What are they doing in Singapore? What are they doing in Hong Kong? What are they doing in Shenzhen, for example, uh, in terms of in terms of encouraging uh, the inflow of of uh, of uh, new companies and equity to the to the system? Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I'm conscious of leaving some time for the Q and A, but I, I did have one more question that I thought it would be good to address to the, the whole panel, and that's the forward-looking piece from here. Um, I thought you know, Simon's comment around ESG being the second most commonly word or commonly used term was very um, accurate for for 2020. I'm sure it'll be number one in 2021, and and certainly from from you know where we sit as a law firm advising on this. Um, we're really starting to see the focus shifting, not just from on European implementation, but to see what's going to happen in the US in the, in the Biden transition and to start mm -hmm. to implement for hard regulation elsewhere in the world. Um, so I think we will be sort of overwhelmed with, with ESG developments, and I think the global financial institutions having to implement for them, them will too. Um, that will present its own challenges, as positive as it is. Um, and so, how do you how do you see from from each of your perspectives um, the future piece looking, and, and how you'll think about tackling some of those those challenges and preparing you know your governance structures for them? Um, Serpa, maybe I'll pass to you first on that one. Well, and this is uh, uh, while answering a halfway comment to to Matt's and question to Simon, and this is the two host carriage. Uh, there's a lot of forces, and I would say uh, almost half uh, or more than half of the politicians in all of our member states, and this is the USA and this is uh, uh, EU to who sort of get the point and who want to make the regulation. But then we do have the uh, another half, uh, and you know all know very well what I'm talking about, that are saying no and they are hearing that lobbying coming from that another half from the businesses saying, no, 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 don't do ever anything. And this is a bad combination. And what I'm sort of saying is that the outcome is that you have a compromise that is in between, like we had in bioenergy. Or then we are having the pot a political haggle about uh, do you need uh, 44 or 50 or 60 uh, netto or brutto uh, climate target for 2030. God heaven's sake, look at it from science, what it says, what uh, the figure needs to be. This is what you do in economics uh, side. And uh, then if you make a wrong figure on there, you lead the businesses to uh, misinvest, like what happens in bioenergy. So I'm not sort of blaming the businesses are doing it, but politicians and to change it. We would need to raise the bar of the ambition and understand that this phenomenon is as we know, uh, exponential. And that's why we would need to do more ambitious decisions than when we make it. And that goes to this sort of a two-way two street and data, science-based, and to put it in a harmonized way in, in regulation. 
And can we find that kind of understanding from the business community, understanding very well that it is not so easy for, for you either to have the advocacy towards the policy to make ambitious enough decisions. And uh, so what, the, what in future? This is my question. And then it goes to the details of regulation because this kind of a scattered regulation is the trend. And this is what we politicians usually do. And it would make much more sense to use the accounting company law, accounting directive, and sort of a set it in parallel with the financial regulation. But do we have the guts to say it as politicians? And do we have the guts to say it as banking sector or investor sector or whatever sector? And uh, there we need a lot of uh, discussions like this and uh, sort of one, uh, sort of a thinking together how to do it, because otherwise, if we waste five years or ten years and make sunk investments, then it, it's a pretty much done deal, and it's extremely uh, inefficient and expensive to to fix the, the the problems by then. Simon, do you want to to react to that one? Oh, cracking! I'm going to react to lots of different things here because I think the discussion's really rich. Really I mean, we, we've sponsored a piece of work with some other banks in the European Banking Federation looking at taxonomy, um, an application in the banking sector. I think that picks up on some of the points uh, earlier. You know, the role of banks is key in asset origination for investors, whether it's through debt capital markets, whether it's through syndications. But I think there's a really big piece there that says, you know, we're going to get impacted by this, whether we, <laughs> whether, whether, whether officially or not. So, so how do we make sure we can manage that? Um, I think. What we're seeing through that is these issues of data availability that have come up. But I also think there's there's a really critical piece, I would agree with Matt and Serpa here, harmonization is critical. The international platform on sustainable finance is doing great work. We're seeing Singapore, the UK and others thinking about taxonomy that is based on the EU characteristics. Capital flows are global. So we need to reflect that in a globally harmonized approach here. Otherwise, we, 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 we risk failing. Um, I would say actually that the, the number one word next year is probably going to be transition. And, and I think to Serpa's points about transition, we have to ask ourselves what portion of the economy does something like taxonomy and do these frameworks cover? Because I think the systemic issue is we do not have a one planet economy. And you can either mm. sort of squeeze everything out and have you know this deep green stuff in one place that's that, that's doing well and everything else, but then you're you're not achieving that systemic transformation. And I think that's where the financial sector can play a role. We're doing a lot of work on things like scaling voluntary carbon markets, which might need to grow by up to 160 times to deliver the Paris Agreement. But then governments and regulators have to play a role on things like fossil fuel subsidies, compliance carbon markets and pricing mechanisms, because voluntary action will get you far enough, or well, won't get you far enough, I should say maybe, because you do get those tough, and back to the whole governance piece, you get those tough discussions where you say, look, it's it's obvious which clients are not going to make this transition and where the risks are too high for, for the reward for the pricing for me. But then there's the mass of the portfolio here where they're not getting there either, but because there are some enablers that are beyond the control of the banking sector or any part of finance, and where you still you still need to have a business as a financial institution, you need to have a client portfolio or an investment portfolio, um, and you get to those difficult decisions as you think, well, if I want to be Paris aligned, you know, who is that? How big can that be? So I think that's where the, the, those two horses, you know, we we need someone holding the whip as well on both of them. Yeah. And and Matt's just it's coming to you for a reaction on that on that discussion. No, I I agree with very much that has been said and and. Uh, but I, I take the liberty maybe to end on a provocative note. Maybe one should be provocative in the beginning rather than the end. <laughs> but you said looking ahead. I mean, there are uh, uh, there was this question about what corporate governance is. Is about making decisions. Uh, and I think a key. Uh, and I think I mentioned this initially. I mean, a key factor for what decisions you make are the incentives that drives you as a decision maker, right? And uh, here I believe. Uh, and instead, in they say that, okay, companies are there to maximize profits or whatever, and that's fine, and that's probably what it should all be about. But if we look at especially financial institutions, asset managers and others, the incentive structures are extremely complex within the organizations, right? I mean, there are people in asset managers, in asset management that make more money than the CEO does, right? Because they are good traders or they are good... They are good computer engineers. I mean, most of these firms are technology firms. So 
uh, I believe taking uh, people's time horizons and etc into into account, uh, I believe that I'm looking forward, as you said, we were looking ahead and what would be next. Uh, will there be uh, firms of, 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 of magnitude that will put in place themselves uh, internal incentive structures that will help drive the agenda that we have been discussing today? Because, I mean, I'm talking to so many asset managers and, and, and portfolio managers, et cetera, and, uh, and they know I'm very engaged in these issues, and they never heard about it, never. Is it, oh, we have, a, we have an ESG department in our firm. We, we, who are they? We don't know who they are. Uh, and these are the guys who are running the show from a day -to -day, on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm asking myself, and I would be, uh, I would be interested to see when, when the first steps towards uh, connecting, connecting uh, the dots between uh, the, the CEO and, and general statements in Davos and the actual action on the ground. I think that's a, uh, that would be a major, uh, but that also introduces the issues of fiduciary duty. What can you do and what should you not do with your, with your beneficiary's money? And that's another discussion we can have in the next seminar. Yep, yeah, and the concept of fiduciary duty is definitely coming up a lot at the moment um, in terms of the advice we're being asked for. Um, and so I, I just wanted to use the last few minutes to turn to some of the questions. Um, and this one I think is quite a good one, certainly from the perspective of outside counsel. Um, you'll often hear us saying that the EU is a whole wave ahead of the rest of the world in terms of legislating for ESG developments. Um, and it has a very you know, deep, complex web of regulation that firms have to comply with. But nevertheless, for the average bank, there will be divisions that are certainly on the face of it in terms of delivering a particular service or product, not impacted by direct regulation at the moment. You have sort of the lawyers acting for certain desks primed for the, the ESG wave, but it's not actually you know, impacting their product line with direct regulation yet. Um, and a question's been asked in that context, I think, which is, you know, what are your thoughts on, on new products that are emerging to sort of meet that investor demand or to manage the bank's own risk? Um, and in this context, ESG-linked derivatives, do these have the potential to direct capital towards more sustainable sources? Serpa, is, is that something that you've, you've seen from the perspective of the European Parliament being thought about and discussed, the sort of more direct product level um, impact that, that banks might face? Well, actually, this is one of the cap, uh, cap of discussions that I would like to continue with you, <clears throat> that we have a sort of a bit, uh, bit of a retrospective way of making legislations, as you know, uh, always in the questions. You have first the phenomenon and problem, and then you sort of think how to figure it out and not sort of this kind of a forecasting inclusive that, okay, if it smells like a bank or... Um, a credit institution, and if it works like it, then it is regulated accordingly. And uh, uh, then uh, you have a separate silos for the new phenomenons, and you know, uh, as you went, uh, mentioned, the digitalization, the fintech, uh, about uh, the what you do with uh, securitization deriv derivatives, and you never touch the sustainability there. And then you have the sustainability as it's sort of an, uh, uh, another silo, and you would need to incorporate, and I hope you could be uh, helpful in that process, in this sort of a looking for the future discussion. Okay, what about then derivatives, securitization, uh, the, the fast speed trading? What about the new uh, digital, uh, be it that of currency or gaming, or what you call it, is the uh, elements that you have emerging? how you deal with them, how you integrate it, how you regulate it, and how you make this change of uh, this kind of a cover regulation that would uh, already anticipate that whatever new phenomenon it would be in virtual world, if it acts like that, it is regulated and touched accordingly. I don't know if you catch my point, but in details, uh, it gets too complicated to, to know how to do it. And there, just advice, please. Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely uh, take that point. And, and I think that goes back to a point you've made earlier, which is 
you know, needing the private sector to act and coalesce through industry bodies to, you know, form standards pending regulation if that's the way that sort of they achieve um, consistent approaches in the market to make the markets function properly. Um, absolutely. And I think we'll see that across a whole range of different product types in the, in the coming years. Um, and I'm just going to end with one question um, that's cropped up a, a couple of times and takes the perspective a little bit broader than, than banking, um, but just recognizing that um, it's some of the, the pension funds and the asset managers are the biggest as asset owners in terms of directing the flow of institutional money, but also the, the insurers. So I think it would be helpful, um, again, just to hear probably from the policymakers on the wider perspective and any sort of thoughts you have on, on the role of the insurers in this space and the role of the, the pension funds as well. Right. No, I'm not an, I, I shouldn't say I'm an expert. We have a section on, on insurance companies in finance outlook you can get on our uh, web page but of course this is an industry that often is is uh, both in terms of uh, their investments but also in terms of their liabilities very involved in issues like like, like uh, Sirpa mentioned early on in terms of flooding or whatever you know I mean this is this is their business and, and they are maybe more advanced in this kind of risk management than most other most other businesses are uh, in terms of in terms of pension funds i mean this goes into the issue of the fiduciary duties again that have been raised recently in many fora i mean what can and should pension funds do with the money of the uh, of the uh, of the beneficiaries I think it's a serious question. Many people have worked a long life, and, and they are they deserve their pensions. They want don't want it to be squandered by 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 by, by anybody. And there was actually a bit of a revolt, as you remember, in Calpers, uh, where eventually a fireman got on the chair, and they they said, I mean, we. we let, let them take care of environment in Sacramento, but you know our pension, I mean, we worked for 40, 50 years to get our pension and, and we want the maximum return. The argument against that is often that pension firms are in there for the long term, right? And, but that argument, I think, only goes so far, and this is to complicate the issue, because uh, for somebody who is 60 or 65 and going into retirement long term maybe 15 years is not an eternal lifespan and you have your private account etc so i think this is a very complex issue and i think we need to take it seriously because it has to do with social cohesion and 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 uh and uh the growing inequalities that we see as well also between age groups because if we uh if if we put if we put the burden of paying for what everybody should be paying for in terms of climate transition or carbon transition, uh, I mean, it, 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 it may lead to, to even more resistance like, like, like Serpa referred to earlier than we have today. I mean, it's, I think, it's a, I think it's a, we need to think hard about using other people's money without increasing inequalities and, and uh, frustration in society between the the elites and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and 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 the, and and the vast majority mm. of our citizens. And any any final comments from from you, Serper, on on that? I could see you nodding furiously. Um, no, uh, at this point, it's a long story. I would like love to <laughs> intervene, but it takes another seminar, webinar, to to, to yeah. touch with that point. So. Uh, not any short version of a commentary. Yeah, part, part, part B. Um, well, well, with that, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to you all, Serpa, Simon, and, and Matt. So I thought that was a, a really insightful discussion. I think we could easily go on for another hour. Um, but thanks also to, to AFMI and to, the, to Tonya and the team for, for doing all of the organization to put this on. Everyone have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. And uh, let's uh, come back on these discussions. Absolutely.